You got it locked on Rodeo Radio. Due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, Dr. Dre is in the motherfucking house. So right about now, and I say, Yo, Steve, are you with me? I C E, are you with me? Here's a little something about a nigga like me that never should have let me buy tape from Steve. Ice Cube would like to play a dope shit mixed by Dr. Dre. Since I was a youth, I like Compton. Now I like the motherfucking rodeo. Buying a tape or two, that's what the hell I do. You don't like Tony A, well fuck you, this is a game. And I'm in it. Ice Cube will fuck you up in a minute with a right, left, right, making you sick. And then you see Tony A is on the mix. Tony A. Tony A. When you're ready, go. Welcome back, everyone, to Rodium Radio, episode 238. And before I introduce my very special guest, I just got a few minor announcements. First and foremost, if you didn't watch The Last Dining with the Wizard, you need to definitely check that out. If you didn't catch the last three verses, verse for verse, where rappers go heads up with each other, definitely go check that out. We have round one, round two, and round three. Round four is coming up next month, so be looking out for that. For those of you that are asking about Freaky Tales, our paranormal podcast, Next month, I'm only doing it twice a month. Uh, we got another, a couple of more Dining with the Wizards coming next month. And this Sunday, we will not have a Rodian Radio episode here because we will be at uh, To Live and Die in L.A. event. We will be podcasting live with host Fabian uh, Alomar. So once again, uh, as a matter of fact, even go check out Fabian's episode. Great, great episode. He will be our host, To Live and Die in L.A., March 26th downtown LA uh, once again we'll be posting up the flyer on during the break so you guys can check that out go get your tickets and we're gonna have a great time but one of my guests uh, um, today will be there if I'm correct headlining the show so it's important that we promote the show and you guys get a uh, if you will an idea of what this man's life is like so without further ado if I have any more uh, uh what you call it? Uh, announcements. Yeah, thank you. I'll announce them before the break, or during the break, or after the break, or whatever. But other than that, once again, without further ado, my guest Joey Quinones. Hey, what's up, Tony? Thanks for having me, brother. And you know what? Sometimes I have so much to remember, and my brain is spinning, and I forget certain things. Oh uh, no, you did really. I mean, I don't know how you did that. I remember <laughs> all those announcements? Like, it's fucking hard to me for me to learn anything like that. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Sometimes. I caught myself, and I want to say my very special guest, and I forgot. And you blank. Yes. Yeah. No. That's so. You know, one time I introduced the band, and I was like, "Oh," and I was the wrong band, and I flashed back like four years, and like the guys <laughs> being in behind me are like, "Where are you?" I'm like, so, I get it. Man. What did you say? Now introducing madness. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Go back to like some, something that I'm not even a part of or something. Yeah. So, so how was your drive coming over? Because I know it's a Wednesday and I was a lot of traffic. How was the traffic, man? I don't mind it, man. You know, I, driving is like the one time that I get to, uh, you know, just kind of like just chill. It feels like, you know, away from the desk, away from the, away from the, the world, you know, in a sense. Uh -huh. Just tune out on some good music or a podcast, you know, so. Yeah. So it, was, it wasn't that bad. It, it, I've had worse. Yeah. Okay. Now, as far as the radio, do you listen to the radio when you drive? I do. I, I listen to... I try to I try to dose it up a little bit in doses. Yeah, I okay. try not to listen to too much. Okay, like like give us an idea. Of what does Joey listen to every once in a while? As I, on the radio? Yes. I mean, I, I listen to one hundred four point seven because that's the only station I get that plays good music out in one in uh, Riverside. Uh -huh. But also, like a lot of the college radio stations, like UCR, oh. they play a lot of local bands and a lot of um, late nights on Fridays. They play a lot of like weird stuff, which I like, you know. Mm, okay. So a lot of college radio stations, but you know, whenever I want to like be a little bit informed, I, I try to turn into like one hundred four point seven or. You know, like a K-Rock, because recently K-Rock's been playing a lot of our music and, and um, a lot of the Southeast L.A. bands. So, wow. so there's, a, there's a, a disc jockey out there that has, you know, infiltrated the asylum, as we say, right. has been playing some of our music. So that's been pretty cool. So I try to tune in once in a while. And, you know, if they're playing some of our music, then, you know, I'm anxious to hear 
other local bands or other upcoming yeah. bands, you know. So you know what? You, out of two hundred and thirty-eight guests, you are the first one that has ever said I listen to college r radio stations. Oh, really? That's yes, an, it's important. It's important. Yeah. When I, you know, if somehow I want to like, I, I feel like when I retire, entertainment or music or anything recording, I, I'd like to end up at a like college radio station and just play weird stuff, cool stuff for the same record, you know, like doesn't matter. I, I would, for some reason that, that sounds like a good retirement to me. You know? Yeah. See, for me, when I retire, I, you know, it's funny. I want to work at a library or at a museum. Yeah. See the same thing. It's, <laughs> I having all this information right there and right in, in, in your hands, you know? Right. Me. I like two, two things I like to listen to in the car when I'm by myself, either some classic rock or believe it or not, uh, college radio station, KUSC, all classical music. Yeah. Yep. I love it, bro. Crazy. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people think I just maybe just listen to oldies. Or they probably think you just listen yeah, to oldies. Yeah, yeah, totally. You yeah. know, they probably think you got the cassette of Bretton Wood or something in there playing 24-7. I do have it in there, but it's a little <laughs> worn out. No, but, no that's okay. great. So what, what classic rock are you listening to right now? Everything from, okay, one of my favorite all-time groups, The Doors. I love Jim Morrison. Okay. I love like Black Sabbath. I love Ozzy, obviously, ACDC. So I listen to a lot of Led Zeppelin, especially Led Zeppelin. Nice. So I like a lot of that kind of stuff. And I also listen to a lot of like new wave, mostly 80s stuff. Okay. One of my favorite groups was uh, Soft Cell. Everybody thinks Soft Cell is just Tainted Love. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more than that. So, Interesting. Yeah. Y you know, uh, I interviewed uh, Prayers here one uh -huh. time. And he asked me, you know, so what kind of music you listen to? And I said, you know what? There was a point in my life where I could have went either way. It could have been hip hop or it could have just been all dark. Mm. Because uh, I had family members that lived in San Gabriel. And he would always tell me all the latest new music outside of hip hop that was coming out. So he introduced me to like uh, uh, what they would call death rock. Okay. And then he introduced me to disco, the high energy stuff that was taken off in the 80s. But my brother was over here showing me funk and hip hop. If, I think if my brother-in-law would have lived closer, I probably would have went to the other side. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, it's kind of like palate cleansers, I feel like. You know, mm -hmm. you, you listen to the music that you do and, you know, you, you feel comfortable with. And, but then you start listening to other stuff where you're able to, like, draw the inspiration and completely forget about work and kind of, like, just get a little bit of that. And it's kind of sometimes it might be a little bit weird, you know. But, right. But sometimes it – because I, I love, like, my, my, like, little – Guilty pleasure, which is not even a guilty pleasure of mine. It's just like I listen to a lot of ska, you know, like a lot of old ska. I love it. Yeah, yeah. but you know, it's it's all it's it's all about balance. Yeah, yeah you know what? Uh, you talk about that. I'm trying to remember the name of the group, but a message to you, Rudy. Yeah, it's the specials. <laughs> yeah, big one. Yeah, and then of course one of my all time favorites. It just it just blew my mind when I first heard it. A young teenager, one step beyond madness. Mm -hmm. Madness. Yep. That's an amazing song right there. It's an anthem. Yeah. It's an anthem for, for a whole generation, a whole era, and a whole scene. Yeah. See, most people just think that madness is our house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then that's it. Yeah. Like, no, there's a lot more. Even the song entitled, uh, titled Madness is an amazing song, too. Yeah. yeah. So they, put, they made good records, and they had great live shows, great live records. Yeah, okay. yeah. Like, at the gym, here's what I bump. Believe it or not, I bump like weird stuff. Uh, Rocky one, the the uh, the first Rocky, the, the soundtrack. The, yeah, soundtrack one. I'll bump it, or like today I was just bumping uh, Rock the Cast Ball by the Clash, but the long version, the oh, one that starts yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, the you know. yeah. I, I've been listening to a lot of Clash. We've been taking a lot of drives, um, you know, which I didn't normally used to do in my old bands. They would never, they would never let me drive. I was like, ah, just let me do it, you know. Like, All <laughs> right, right. But now, you know, we've been traveling with the Altons and the Sincere's alive and enjoying the driving and stuff and you know a lot of the a lot of the playlists has been the clash so i've been trying to i'm a big album person i love listening to the albums because i feel like that's lost nowadays you know it's yes. like singles scroll neck swipe you know yes. but like albums are like i like that's my goal is to make at least one good kind of like dark side or you know you know like uh any you know those timeless records that you could listen to all the way through and you don't want to skip anything you know the classics the classics yeah. yeah okay so now where is joey quinones originally from where, where were you where did you where did you grow up at fontana california born kaiser right there no shit. right in fontucky is the uh Fontucky? Like yeah. That's the first I like time I heard that. You no, know, you never heard that before? No, never. Oh, man, I get so much crap about that from everywhere. <laughs> you know, actually at the Hit Switches Festival, there was, I can't remember the comedian's name. Uh, uh, the girl? The girl, yeah. What oh, was her yeah. name? Uh, Tanya. Tanya. Yeah. She was busting balls about Rialto. She was calling out the cries, like, where are you from? Rialto? Like, what? Where's that? You know, and just talking, I was like, shots fired, because Rialto's, you know, kind of the same as at Fontana, but... 
that's where I was born. That's where my parents decided to move out of the out of the barrio and fucking get a house and settle up. And they raised us, try to raise us right. And you know, it didn't last long. We we ended up moving back. And and you know, so I was, I was born out here in San Bernardino, uh, out there in San Bernardino. And right. then yeah, and then um, moved out to East LA with my mom and my and my, and my grandfather. Okay. About when I was like 10 years old. So. Okay. So you went to, uh, I, I believe you told me you went to Garfield High School. I went to Garfield. I'm what, so I went out to middle uh, elementary school out there. I went to Ford Boulevard and Griffith Middle School, which is both, all three mascots, middle school, high school, and, you know, grade school is uh, Bulldog. Okay. You know, for that. So so I'm considered what you call a purebred Bulldogs. You know, and oh, I remember okay. people being very proud about that. If you go to all three schools, you know, it's like, I didn't really care. You know, I just... <laughs> I just wanted to get out of Fontana, out of Rialto, but I was happy to be in LA and exciting, you know, and you know, that's where kind of, I always say that's kind of like where my ears opened up, you know, because it's exposed to skateboarding and punk rock music and yeah. you know, guitar and. Are, are you a big punk rock fan? I know I you mentioned punk rock. The, oh, yeah. the Clash. Yeah, The Clash. Um, I got, you know, the first band I ever got into was the Green Day and Operation Ivy, you know, like those kind of like Bay Area kind of bands from the 90s. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, that kind of got me into, you know, I mean, the only way you could meet girls at the time was skateboarding and playing yeah. guitar, and I couldn't skateboard, so <laughs> I had to learn how to play guitar, you know? Did, did, did you know how to skate? Oh, no, no, I couldn't. <laughs> terrible, terrible at it. Yeah. Growing up, you play any sports? Baseball. A lot okay. of baseball, yeah. Were you good? Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I mean, it's literally, you can never tell at that okay. age. You know, you, you, you put your heart and everything into it, but... You know, I, I knew that, you know, whenever there was something related to baseball and anything, whether it was rehearsal or, you know, we, we, wow, I'm such a, a musician, I call it rehearsal, whatever there was practice right. or, or, you know, or just a game. Like I was, I was always committed to that. And I, you know, we actually had a, a, a baseball game recently. We, we, um, I don't want to say this on air, but we, we had canceled a, a, a show. Let's just say we had, you know, okay. we had a show and we were like, huh, but then the stars lined up for us to play baseball with, you know, with Trish Toledo's band. Okay. You know, and, and for people that know out there, we kind of share members so, and, and um, it's kind of a funny story because, you know, we've been talking about it, like, you know, everybody, because every time the Dodgers, you know, were on TV, you know, we would all like at the bar, we'd stop and like, like, oh, you like baseball? Oh, okay, cool. So it became like, we all like baseball. So... Then we decided, like, you know, we're going to rent out. I think it was for her birthday, actually. We was around Tristan Selena. People are doing the math, trying to figure out which show I get. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so um, it was Trisha's birthday. We had, we pulled, so we rented out this baseball field, and we're like, all right, we're going to play the Sincere's versus Trisha's band. You know, and, and the whole week leading up to it, you know, we were, because some of us were doing some of the Brenton Wood backing shows. Yeah. So we were at the Greek Theater, and we were at the, you know, at the Ontario uh, Sports Area Toyota Arena and like just outside backstage, like warming up, playing catch, you know, just like trying to run drills and trying to run practices before sound checks and stuff. But and day comes the the, the 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 game and we end up playing like we ended up going like maybe like only like six, seven innings or something like that, because somebody got it. Well, our sax player's finger broke and, you know, it just it was just we like a bunch of unprofessional, a bunch of musicians trying to play <laughs> professional baseball, you know, as, as we thought it was. But it was so much fun. And and so to answer your question, yeah, baseball is probably the, the one, you know, OK. Mostly. Uh, 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 did you ever attend a lot of Garfield and uh, uh, Roosevelt football games? Oh, yeah. A lot of them. Every, almost, you know, for a couple of years because I was in the marching band, we did. We you know we'd be there every Friday and, you know, and but at the same time I was balancing being in a band that was kind of had a a, a a development deal from a record major record label. Oh wow! And I was you know I was fifteen sixteen years old. Wow! You know balancing this school life, marching band life, and this professional musician life. And you know I'd have to have like my manager come and talk to my band director of like he has a gig can he skip out after you know halftime like you know just like people like just going out of their way just to get me to where whether it's where I should have been or whether or not they were trying to get me to where they thought I should have been. Yeah. Right, right. So okay. So uh, uh, you mentioned baseball. Are you a big-time Dodger fan? Oh, yeah. Dodgers. Lakers? Lakers, yes. Yeah. Do you have a football team? Football team? You know what? I'm going to – I don't want to, like, you know, put it out there, but my, <laughs> my dad's a big Vikings fan. So. Oh, okay. So I got I to gotta go out and support his – you know, because I'm not so much into football. I love football. I love playing football. I love – I don't follow it as much as, I, as the other sports, but he's always been a Viking fan and a diehard one at that. So mm, I always okay. feel like I have to represent for him, you know. Hey, that'll work. Yeah. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that you came to back to from Fontana, Fontucky, to live uh, back in East LA. Uh, 
living with your, if I'm correct, you said with your mom and your grandfather. Mm -hmm. Now, what type of music would they play at home that you grew up with? Well, I remember that's the first time I seen a record, you know, a vinyl record. Okay. And it was all Spanish music that my dad, that my grandfather had. But my mom, you know, she would always play the Motown, you know, the, the Smokey. She was, she was always saying, my Smokey, every time it would come on, the volume would blast up. My Smokey. And then that's it. It's all you could hear. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, you know, or like when she'd be cleaning, she'd be playing La Sonora Dinamita. So it was all over the place with her, at least. She was into anything melodic. And, and I feel like looking back at it now, it's just everything that kind of like had like a nice... Nice groove, but a very nice melody, you know, or a great right. singer. So she got me exposed to a lot of that. And Janet Jackson, she loved Janet Jackson, Salt and Pepper, and stuff like that. And um, and then you know, I'd go to my dad's on the weekend, and he would be playing. You know, he would drag us. He would have us for the weekends, and he's been in the car club since '79. Oh, okay. You know, Techniques Car Club, shout out Techniques. And um, he always took us to the car shows on his weekends. You know, like you know. So we'd be there on Sundays at the car shows, and all you all you hear was Malo and Santana and Brandwood, and you saw I, that's kind of like how that kind of subliminally kind of sponged into my brain. I feel like, but it was kind of coming from everywhere. And then once I got out to LA, it was like I found my own thing, which was punk rock. It was like forget all that. I want to listen to my own thing, you know. Mm. But it was still there. Okay. Now, now you know what? Uh, what was it about punk rock that you gravitated towards it? I think just. Being young, the energy, um, you know, I can't explain it. I think just, you know, growing up when you saw, when you saw La Bamba, you know, when you yeah. saw the movie La Bamba, when you saw Richie with his guitar and you saw that whole kind of like transition of being, coming from where he came from to having a, a dream to succeeding in that. And then it just, you know, unfortunately it getting cut short, you know, which is another story for another day. But, you know, I think just that, just like seeing somebody that looked and kind of represented what you were coming from. Kind of, I think that just kind of set off the fire to, to kind of do that. I think, you know. Wow, wow, yeah. You know, what's, it's funny because again, I think people are getting a totally different side of you that they probably didn't expect. And I think you're very well rounded in music. Because, for an example, I kind of, even though I'm not a singer, I'm not a musician, but I look at DJing almost in a sense the same way. One day I was asked by uh, somebody of, of this generation, what kind of DJ are you or were you? So I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, yeah, are you a hip hop DJ? Are you like a pop DJ? And I was like, no, when I grew up, I had to play everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I had, what do you mean? You, yeah, I, from Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Springsteen to Madonna, to Cameo, to the Barcades, to War. I had to play everything. Well, I, I'm just a hip hop. And then I realized that there's different DJs now. So as far as you when you uh, uh, grew up, you listened to everything, whether it was ska, whether it was punk, whether it was oldies, whether, like you said, Sonora Dinamita, it was just so much around you, mm -hmm. you know. So um, now, I remember I was asked this question about two years ago on a podcast, and they asked me, what did your father play growing up? Because my father was a big influence on me when it came to music. Mm -hmm. And I still remember as a kid, the very first song I've ever heard as a kid, and you know what it was? The Monster Mash. <laughs> Yeah. That song slams, man. Yeah. It was a hit. It was a hit. Yes. And I remember he had the 45. Wow. Yeah. I go, mira, mijo. And he had the big old console. You know, we opened it and then. The shit was hard, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you hear the bubbles? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, damn. No. Exactly. Oh, man, my dad, was, my dad was, was all over the place, too, I feel like, because he. And, you know, and more and more, the, I meet the people that he grew up with, and you know, it's because because I, uh, I didn't live with my dad maybe through I want to say like from seven to twenty two, twenty three, maybe because uh, when I got off the road, it's okay. It's a long story of that, but I, I didn't spend a lot of time with him in a living situation for many years. And when I when I came back to Rialto and I, I was like, you know, and he's he's the first person to tell me save up, figure out what you're gonna do. You need some help, we'll invest, we'll we'll set it aside, but but do it, you know. And he was the first person to, to help me out when I came back and you know after after trying out this musical thing and leaving at home at 16 on the road with this band that was sure to make it, right? You know, so we, it didn't work out. So after that, I tried to I didn't want to go home. I wanted to kind of succeed at what I was trying to do and, and 
when it didn't happen, when it didn't happen right away, I, he was the first person to welcome me back. So I started, I lived with him for the first time as an adult. And I was like, you know, we were kind of just kind of getting to know each other in, in a different sense, you know, then. So, so he, he uh, would play the Eagles, James Taylor, you know, uh, Michael McDonald, stuff like that. Like yeah. just stuff that was so chill and so backwards from what, you know, I started expecting that he always was because again, like, you know, now when I meet people that know him from back in the day, you know, like the other people that they, they all, all they listen to is oldies, all they listen to is, is Bretton Wood and, you know, War, which is great. I love, that's my, I mean, I got a tattoo of war. It's my favorite band of all time, but like, I didn't expect that, you know, like, and, and it kind of just brought out another side and it, and, and it, and it made me look at music differently because I completely skipped that whole kind of soft rock California sound, if you would, kind yeah. of like rock and roll. But now I love it, you know, because I'm an engineer, I record, I could find the appreciation of how recording technology transitioned in that era and songwriting and, you know, people stopped using the studio band and the studio songwriter and they started just getting in a room and making songs. Right. So I started kind of like, I was able to appreciate that, but it was, it, was, it took me a while to appreciate it. Like, you're listening to that, like wider shade of pale, like what? Like, you know, mm -hmm. it was such a cheesy song to me, but now like, I, I'm reminded of him every time I hear it, you know, and I okay. love it. That's dope. Yeah, yeah. My my dad was very, very instrumental, very influential. Uh, uh, when it, when his his music, like Los Panchos, whether it was, uh, um, he listened to a lot of Pedro Infante, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of his movies. He introduced me to a lot of movies, a lot of art. A lot. I think I got a lot of his. Uh, how would you say, his gifts or his talent all came from him, you know, and uh, but, I, I wanted to ask you. Growing up, did you play any instruments at all? I mean, I didn't really touch anything until I moved out to L.A., you know. Okay. And it was, it was pretty much like I said. And, I, you know, and, and I didn't have any relatives to bring anything around. And and I think it just feels like every, when I, once I moved to L.A., it was just like I saw color. It was like weird, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm partially colorblind, my friend, you know what I mean? But, no, in, in a sense, you know, you just, you, all these sense, senses just, like, were, electrified and and it's just really really on on alert you know when i moved to la and i think you know like once i moved out of there it's just like like i said the only thing to do at the time was skateboard and play guitar so like i had to pick one or the other and i couldn't skateboard at all so they you know get, guitar was the first thing i wanted to learn and and i remember the neighbor across the street my brother had gotten a guitar for christmas mm -hmm. and it sat there he learned like pretty woman and a couple songs and i was like whoa that's so dope you know but it sat in the closet for a long time, and, and until we moved to L.A., you know, my, uh, my neighbor was playing, and, and he was, like, the most popular guy in the neighborhood, the most popular dude at school. He was in the football team, you know, and it was just, like, and he played electric guitar, like, wow, like, yeah, you know. So I started hanging out with him and, and just trying to, like, you know, just copy him and, like, learn my favorite songs. And I started noticing that I was, had a really good ear where I could pick up things fast. That's a that real age. good thing, yes. Yeah, because we, you know, we'd go to the mall. And, you know, my, 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 my mom would like, you know, here, just want to stay. And like, she wouldn't be able to let me away. It was called Mr. Entertainment. It wasn't even Sam Mash at the time. It was called okay. Mr. Entertainment. And it was just like a DJ store with speakers, a couple guitars, a keyboard. But that keyboard was just so magnetic to me where I wanted to figure out this chess game of an instrument, you know. So I'd be there for hours while they'd shopping. And they'd come back, pick me up. I'd still be there with my older sister or, you know, whoever was there watching me, trying to take care of me. And that just what stuck with me that I was able to kind of pick that up. So, you know, watching this guy across the street play guitar, I was like, I could do that, you know. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. You know, I started learning up, and then my parents started noticing, and then they saved up every little penny they had to buy me a PV guitar, you know, with a little tiny amp, and then I was ready to go. You know, I was rocking. Right, right. There was no, there was no bands in L.A. that needed guitar players because everybody played guitar, you know. So oh, okay. It just, it just turned into, like, whatever you could play, go ahead and and the only bands that needed more than guitar players and drummers was ska bands. So started playing trumpet. Yeah. Okay. Damn. So, so you went from guitar to keyboards to trumpet. Keyboards, guitar, to trumpet. Yeah. But I was never really, I was just, that was like the most first musical experience is kind of piano. Just like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know? Okay. Now, when you saw that guy that lived across the street with the guitar, but how old were you when you saw that? I was about 12, 13, and he was maybe 16, going on 17. Okay. Uh, just in a nutshell, just to kind of get, okay. I've been DJing since I, I got into, I went to a nightclub when I was 11 years old. That's when I got introduced 
to DJ and I knew what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, I started DJing. I started doing mixtapes in the late eighties and then I started producing and my, my whole thing was like, I never wanted to, uh, uh, produce. I just wanted to DJ. But when I started producing, you know, that's when I started getting introduced to the SB 1200, mm-hmm. the drum machine, you know, mm-hmm. that's like my baby right there. But I, I it just began to evolve in the MPC 60 or et cetera. But like, I tried so hard when I get into when I got into producing, I to buy uh, play keyboards. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. I have a good ear and I know what to tell my musician what to play, but I just do not have the time and patience to sit there and learn it. Same uh, way. Yeah. And and I'll give an example because in, in in this studio I used to collect vintage keyboards. Okay. okay? I bought like the Honer clavinet. Uh, wow. uh, uh, an original, you know, the you original. You never one. see those, yeah. Yeah, I, I got them all refurbished. As a matter of fact, I got the 80, 88 key uh, Fender Rhodes. As a matter of fact, I let Tina Marie use that. Nice. Um, I had the Oberheim. I had the Art Odyssey, and I collected like the mini moves I had, but I had the all five different mm-hmm. ones. But there were more. But I even had the realistic uh, from Radio Shack, a little mi- uh, Moog. Yeah, yeah, you know? I remember that. So, but when the two thousands came around, I noticed that these kids were switching to laptops and a keyboard. Nobody wanted any vintage stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's when I kind of just like, I give up. I got to get rid of this crap. I had over like $30,000 just with the keyboards in this room, you know. But the, the cl- clavinet, that, wah, 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 that motherfucker was hard, bro. You know, but I still got songs that I did, uh, um, you know, with, with those instruments. Uh, are you a uh, vintage? Uh, 100%. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's been a obsession for the past I want to say six, seven years for sure. Okay. But, you know, like to go back to the other spectrum of that, like I've written my best and my favorite songs on a laptop and a guitar, you know, yeah. just kind of getting into it because those are the tools that are handed to you. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I remember starting really early that I didn't even know what I was doing, but, you know, I used to, I used to record, um, I used to record on this little two track that my, my hi-fi stereo system my mom used to have and, it was a vinyl player, it had a CD player. No, it wasn't even a CD player, it was just a vinyl player it plugged into the TV and then it had a phonograph on it. And you know, and but it had the best, which I still to this day cannot replicate like the sound of that like distortion. You know, it was just like when you overload the speakers and you know, whatever speakers we were using at the time, but it was the best sound I've ever gotten. But I remember at the time like, you know, recording and then like kinda like flipping over and ping pong what they call ping pong in tracks, overdubbing and stuff on two track and going back and forth and kinda doing that. And, you know, I, like, looking back, like, that was, like, some, like, hi-fi stuff that I do normally in my everyday job now, right. you know. But, yeah, like, it was just kind of, like, growing up with the stuff that you had, you know, just to kind of get that create creativity out. And yeah, I remember once once I found, like, a, I think it was, like, a Fostex, like, a red Fostex multi-track six kind of, like, fader thing where you could put six channels and then you could ping pong, you could do it, and it's unlimited, you know. Once I got that, I was just like, all right, I'm open for business. I'm going to record all my friends' punk bands and make $10 at the time, whatever it was, you know. So I've always kind of been interested in that and, you know, kind of getting into that. But, like, vintage has kind of just been something that's always spoken to me. And, yes. and you know, the smell of the tubes and the smell of, like, you know, like, it's like old books and, like, just, you know. Especially old metal, books. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it has that scent that just reminds you of, like, these things have stood time and many, many people have come and gone to look or touch or feel or use yes. this tool to get to the next step where you and I feel like that process is always important. In, in 1987, I was introduced to the Tascam Porta 1 4 track. The cassette one. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So that's when I started doing mixed tapes off of those. Everybody thought I had four turntables. But like, like the mix that you heard at the intro, that was all done on a 4 track with Dre and Ice Cube ramping on them. Yeah. Then eventually I graduated to the Tascam 388 with the. Uh, oh um, man, that's you know how much those things are now. Yeah, you know what's how funny? much did you get one of those for back in the day? I actually, my manager bought it for me. Okay, so I it was funny because okay, how many gigs did you had to do for that day? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> well, it, well, well, you know what the, the dope thing was that we were about to get signed to Disney, mm-hmm. and so he advanced me the money and yeah. he just said just buy it. So when I started doing eight track mixes, everybody's like, you got eight turntables or something. I just didn't tell anybody, yeah. you know, but the crazy part about that, that, um, that um, the 388, I once posted a picture 
And this was like maybe two pages ago. When I say pages ago on Instagram, because I get my pages deleted all the time. Yeah, yeah. Or they cap out. and Right. Yeah. So you were following me on one of them, and you actually commented and said, do you still have that? Yeah. And then I said, no, that was from the 80s, and then you never replied. <laughs> but I was like, ah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, those things are getting more and more. Because you know what it is? It's like a lot of that, like the... You know, for, for fail for a better term, a lot of the hipsters, you know, started like falling in love with that eight track yes. kind of quarter inch sound. Yes. And it, that was like the most accessible, accessible machine that kind of had a mixer where you didn't need to buy a bunch of wires and preamps and stuff. You just boom, ready to go. So how would you do it? You would just kind of like you would record one sequence on one track and then kind of. Of course, like for, for, for an example. Uh, say I had a uh, make the music with your mouth is by Biz Markey. I would flip it over, put the instrumental, put it on track one. Okay, then what I would do uh, with another one, I'll play, let that play for about two minutes. Then I, I, let's just say I have a Roxanne Chante payback instrumental. I would mix it after two minutes, all on the same track, and then just keep going. And I was a good blender. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. on one track with good levels, I had uh, uh, multiple uh, instrumental beats. So what I would do, uh, boom, but cap, boom, double, 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 boom, but cap on track two. Yeah. And then, you know, after I double, double, click K. So you hear all of these things coming in. You're like. Yeah, it's like 20 arms. Yes, yeah. exactly. I'm the yeah. Mexican octopus. So, <laughs> but Crazy. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break. But when we come back, I want to see how you got into that ska band. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once again, everybody, call somebody, text somebody, slap the shit out of somebody, and let them know that Joey Quinones is in the motherfucking building. We'll be back 10 minutes. Do. It's your boy Cap G. Subscribe to Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. The Wizard. Yes, sir. Yo, what's up, y'all? This is King T chilling on Rhodium Radio. Tune in, subscribe every Sunday and Wednesday. Fucking with my man Tony A. The Wizard. West up, this Lazy Dub, and you're tuned in to Rhodium Radio right here with Tony A. The Wizard on every Sunday and Wednesday, 7 p.m. Make sure you like and subscribe back. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm right here at Local Negro, Tony A, Rodium Radio. Tune in. Yo, yo, what's up? It's your boy MTO right here with Tony A, the Wizard on Rodium Radio. Make sure you like and subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. What's up, everybody? It's your homegirl, Lovely, and I'm right here at Rodium Radio with my boy Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you subscribe and check them out every Sunday and Wednesday. It's Nina Beretta with Rhodium Radio and Tony A. The Wizard. Tune in Sundays and Wednesdays. Like and subscribe. What's up, everybody? This is a Puppet Master chilling with El Triste. Follow and subscribe to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Rashidi Harper, director, executive producer from Hip Hop Uncovered. And I'm here at the Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Stay tuned. Coming at you live through the Harbor area, you got MC Poncho, the number one Sancho. And you're checking out Rhodium Radio with my man, Tony A. the Wizard. Check it out. What's up? This is Ronan Gray. You're watching Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday and Sunday. What up, this is Mr. D over at Rhodium Radio with my homeboy Tony A the Wizard. Make sure you subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. What's up, y'all? This is Uncle Spliff, man, from Spliff DTV. Y'all need to tune in every Sunday and Wednesday to Rhodium Radio with my homie Tony A the Wizard. Yo, you're tapping in with the Steel City Hustlers. This is Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A the Wizard. Motherfucking legend, make sure you fucking like, subscribe, share, do all that shit, you know what's happening. Yo, it's your boy Troublesome Man, TM Gang Live in Full Effect, here at Rodeon Radio with my boy Tony A, the Wizard, you know what it is, boy. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Ernie G in the place to be. I'm chilling here at Rhodium Radio with my homeboy Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. Watch those locals forever. Yo, what's up? Ben is your boy Young Hype here at Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the wizard. Make sure y'all subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday.
Yeah, doge. Yo, what's up? It's Anthony Campos, a.k.a. Big Citre, inviting everybody to tune in and subscribe to Tony Vision, Rodeon Radio, with your host, Tony A. The Wizard. What's happening? It's your boy Bobby Castro, and I'm here at Rodium Radio with the homie Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure to like, subscribe, check out the shit. What's good, y'all? Eric Bobo from the mighty Cypress Hill, chilling right here on Rodium Radio with the homeboy Tony A, the Wizard. That's right. Hey, everybody, this is Cliff Ritchie, and I'm here on Rodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard. What's cracking it's your homie crazy boy blue rain music you tune in the rhodium radio with the homie tony a the wizard tune in every wednesday and sunday right here what's up everybody this is dally c the trap queen and you guys are listening to rhodium radio with tony a the wizard make sure you guys tune in yo what's up this is dj bobby b and you're live with tony a the wizard on rhodium radio 1212 coming to you live from the Harbor area. DJ Ralph Fan rocking beats with my man Tony A rocking the SP1200. Let's go. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Yella coming straight out of Compton Rhodium Radio with my boy Tony A, the wizard. Check him out. Hey, what's up? It's your girl, Men Scott. This is from NYC. And I'm Saki with Tony A. The Wizard at Rodium Radio. You already know how to bring the NYC love. Hey, shout out to all of you guys. Hey, what's cracking? It's that guilty one. You're tuned in to Rodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Live every Sunday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Like and subscribe. Ah. What's going on? It's Hazard. You are tuned in with Tony A. The Wizard on Rodium Radio. Make sure you tune in every Sunday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Yo, yo, this is your boy Invincible, and you are watching the Rhodium Radio Show with Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you're tuned in and watching. Ooh, ah. What's up, guys? This is Isabella Soul, and you're tuning in with Tony A, the Wizard on Rhodium Radio. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Peace. What's up, guys? It's your girl, J Rocks. I'm here on Rhodium Radio with your host, Tony A. the Wizard. I'll make sure to tune in on Sundays and Wednesdays, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Yo, what's up? This is Jose Homicide. You hanging out at Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. the Wizard. Like and subscribe.
Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio, episode 238. And you know what? We're just going to go ahead and jump right back in it with Joey Quinones. And uh, if you guys want to meet him, you guys want to chop it up with him, take a picture with him, listen to him. He'll be at March 26th, Saturday, uh, uh, to live and die in L.A., hosted by Fabian Alomar. So make sure you guys get your tickets. Other than that, I'm going to start off with a question really quick. Do you remember your first record you ever had? First vinyl record? Correct. Oof. That I ever owned, I remember it was. Uh, I think it was Al Green's Greatest Hits, just because I was like barely getting into the vinyl. No, 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 I'm lying. I'm lying. It was Jimmy Cliff Live. Jimmy Cliff was a reggae singer. Who did a, he did a film? Yeah. How do they come? <clears throat> and uh, I got that right live record because you know at the time I was playing a lot of reggae bands, and one of the good friends at the time was a, a record collector and. I had done a, uh, a favor for him with our band. We had played at his niece's party or something, and he's like, hey, I want you to have this. Like, I don't even have a player, but man, thank you. you know? So I went and bought a record player, and, and they had, like, later what later became, like, my favorite musicians on that record. So this is a big one. Jimmy Cliff Live. Though, though I was about to say, um, when you said Al Green, because when he did Love and Happiness, man, I can hear that B3 Hammond organ with the Leslie speaker. I had one of those in here. No way. Yeah, I bought it from a church. I just got it from a, from a pastor. Oh, got, like, for real? And, and, and you know what? I do this. This is, this is Again, I'm, I'm telling all the secrets right now. But, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like, you know, because, you know, we've always looked at it. Me and my bandmates, like, you know, we, we're doing, you know, this is this is our church. You know, this is, you know, we're, our studio is our church. You know, we we come here, we gather, you know, we, we, you know, spread a message. You know, we learn a message and we spread it, you know. And so every time, you know, because I, I don't have a studio, so every time I buy stuff, kind of like an organ or a Leslie or speaker like that, I, you know, and I get it. The best ones always come from churches because they always use them frequently and keep them up, keep them really, you know, yeah. really well. So the last, I just bought a Hammond B3 that I was so excited about that I got for like l less than a quarter of the price they're running today. You really? Know? So it was just like a really big, and but that, like you said, that Hammond sound, like Al Green, the Santana, like when you hear that B3 going through a Leslie, mm -hmm. it's just, there's nothing that, there's no Nord or, or Korg or Roland that could replicate that. Uh, R right. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. So if you guys don't know what a B3 Hammond organ with the Leslie speaker is, Google it. You guys can do that now. Yeah, look it up. Look it up. <laughs> you know, but, um, <laughs> Mine was uh, Kiss Love Gun. Oh, yeah, big one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was the very first concert that I went to was Kiss. No way, you saw yes. Kiss. Yes, Kiss a a at the Forum. At the Forum. Uh, uh, my older brother, because I have five brothers, four sisters, okay? And my older brother took me, because I was doing good in school. Mm -hmm. I was in fourth grade, and he said, I'm going to take you to go see Kiss. My older, one of my older brothers and then one of my younger brothers wanted to go with us, with, with, with me. And I said, you guys don't even like kids. You guys talk crap about this band that I like. Because to them, they were devil worshipers. And makeup all, guys. Yeah. yeah. All they do is yell. Yeah. Okay. But I'll tell you what, when they got there and the crowd is yelling, we want kiss. I look at both my brothers and they're like, we want kiss. Off, yes. Makeup on. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. After that, uh, Blondie. Blondie. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It was the, ah, fuck. Um, no, it, it was. I believe it was before it was before Rapture. Remember, uh, not the Titus High. It was one of the popular songs that uh, I'll remember. I'll tell you. Damn it! But uh, Blondie was my, my, that one, and then the, my third record, and all this when I was in elementary. Uh, uh, Brick dance. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the song right there that intrigued me, and that started me into looking into sounds. Yeah. Because when Daz, boom, 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 push, wow, 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 I always said, what the hell is that? So I would always ask people, I want to play you something, and I want you to tell me what the, oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. And still nobody's ever told me. I always figured it was a guitar. Can you tell me? I, you know, it sounds, to me, it sounds <laughs> like some kind of like sitar. You know, in the 70s, like like a lot of the Delphonics guys use, yeah. like, um, like that, I don't know if it's like a pedal or like a, Okay, we'll back up to like the 60s when psychedelic music was huge. Right. You know, so you had all these London shops and all these Philippine and Japanese kind of guitar makers making these sitars, you know, which was an electric guitar that shaped like a sitar, fretted like, you could play it like a guitar, but it sounded like a sitar. Sitar from Egypt, I mean, I mean, India, if I'm correct? India, yeah, yeah, correct. So um, 
for me, my ears, that's what I feel like, you know, could maybe with a little bit of effect on it, like a processor on it, something to make it a little bit more extra psychedelic. But to me, that sounds like either like some kind of keyboard or like a sitar yeah. effect. Yes. Yeah. That's a dope ass fucking sound. Though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, talking about the sitar, the first time that I ever heard it was remember Rolling Stones painted black. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the hell is that? Yeah. yeah. You know, so I was always in search of sounds like that mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know like uh remember that song uh um uh, god uh, it's a girl with the Bee Gees. god anyways that's when i first heard up in the roads okay yeah and i was like what is that and my brother was like what that noise that it's a real pretty sound but it's not a piano mm -hmm. you know he goes i don't i can't hear it so I always had sound, you know, an ear you for that. Pick stuff out. Yes. Yeah. So when you said, "Oh, I have an ear," that's yeah. what it reminded me of. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know. You know, I remember watching that. That um, I don't know if you saw that Selena Netflix series that they yes. did. And there's a scene where they're kind of like watching. They're, they're the dad sits them down and they're like listening to a record and he's asking him to pick out the instruments, mm. you know, and like. Later on, you hear interviews about, I think the Susie was talking about how she hated that because it was really hard for her. But I remember thinking back, like, man, that was so easy for me because that's now that's how I see and, see and hear music is like whenever it's on the radio, I see it as like on the faders where, where everything sits right. and kind of where everything is and what's going through it because that's just how my brain works now. But I might be, I'm, I've always been able to kind of pick out, isolate, like that's what that's doing, that's what that's doing. And I've gotten in arguments because... You know, like we 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 used to be in a, a band that used to back a lot of the old, old reggae singers that used to come from Jamaica to the '60s, passing their way up up to Northern Cali, and we'd be the LA band backing them up for their LA stop. Yeah. So we'd have all these guys come out like Alton Alice. We'd have Derek Morgan. We'd have, you know, all these dudes come out, and you know, we'd have to learn these really, really, really archaic recordings and like primal, like just like these really nasty recordings of these songs. And I'd get in a lot of arguments with my keyboard player because he, we've always kind of like grown up the same way as far as musically our path. But you know, like no, he's playing this note. Like no, he's playing this note. Like <laughs> listen to the bass. You got to, you know. So we've always kind of argued about that. But I've always been able to kind of like distinguish that, just like how you are. Like what's that noise? And I want to, I, I want to know everything about it, and I want to perfect that, and I want to use it somehow tastefully. You know. Yes, yes. I uh, I could play you some of the stuff that I did for a lot of a lot of rappers that. They didn't get it. Mm. And I was like, bro, this is good music, bro. Like I'm using a honer here. I'm using a I'm using a 88 key from the roads, homie. The bass line is from a mini moog. Okay. But they were like, I I, I don't know. It's just yeah, different. Yeah. That's the point. It's different. But a, a lot of guys, especially in this generation, they don't want to try something different. They want to like, whoa, trap is is hey, popping. Yeah. Yes. So I kind of go against the grain when it comes to music, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you probably did too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, tell us a little bit about the ska band. How did that happen? Did you see a flyer somewhere and said, let me sign up? I think it was just like, you know, out of that, like, you know, growing up in East LA, everybody played guitar or drums, and there was not, you know, anything else to do. And when you did that, like, you know, there wasn't any bands to join. And I think, you know, like my, my friend kind of like, he kind of tricked me in a way. Uh, shout out to Tony from The Illusions. Um, he uh, he kind of told me to show up. He's like, oh, you know, come to this band practice audition. You know, we're going to try you out. And it's like, I'm going to bring my guitar. You know, hey, I'm bring my app. And I'm going to you know, show these guys and I could do it, you know. And, like, we got there and the guy's like, oh, like, um, we already have a guitar. The other guy's the guitar player who I learned out, found out later was like, hey, we already have a guitar player. So, you know, don't worry about it. And I'm like, uh, like wasting my time coming here. <laughs> And then my buddy's like, hey, this guy plays trumpet. He plays trumpet, too. And he's like, you play trumpet? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I found out it was a ska band. I didn't know what ska was at the time. Mm. You know, the only ska that I've heard was, like, Goldfinger and Real Big Fish, you know, the Orange County kind of, right. you know, like, ska that, you know, that you were kind of like, it, you bobbed your head, but you still kind of laughed at it a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because we were punk rockers. I wanted to be a punk rocker, but, you know, the, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to, I want to be in a band. I'll play trumpet, you know? So we played and, you know, and my buddy played trumpet too. He was the trumpet player and he had an extra one. So he lent me his and we played and blah, blah. And then like, we went good, learned all the songs and the guitar player, the same guy that told me we already had a guitar player. He's like, oh, you know, you know, yeah. You know, well, Tony plays trumpet. So, you know, 
we don't really need you, but if you could play trombone, you know, that'd be kind of cool. So I remember thinking like, all right, all right, dude. All right. <laughs> so the next day I did school and, and like stood in the band room all day cause I was in marching band and I like picked out a trombone from the, from the drawer and I was just trying to learn the entire thing that I learned the night before on trombone. So that way the next week when I showed up, I just went at it, you know, and I was like, you want a trombone player? Here I am. Because just so determined to be in a band at some, at all costs, you know. That's so, awesome, man. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so I just did whatever I had to do and, and showed up the next week, did it, and I was in a band and we were off, you know. Did they ever say, oh, we don't need a trombone player anymore. We're looking for a guy to play kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> that was later. That was later. Okay. Uh, but I've always kind of been that guy, even in a marching band. Like, you know, like, like as, as I joined the Garfield marching band, they had gone from winning year after year of, you know, LAUSD competitions, you know, because they were such a great, they had a, a director, the same director for the past 35, whatever years. As soon as I got there, he had retired and we had this whole kind of catch up, kind of get a new director going, but we still won, you know, and, but the band got smaller and smaller every year. So every year it was like, oh, well, we need more malaphone players, put him and him. And then like, I used to think like, man, this is like, they're picking on me, you know, they're, but later on looking back, I realized like they depended on me and they trusted me. You know, mm -hmm. so, so that kind of like that mentality later on came into full effect. But back then it was really frustrating kind of being moved around from section to section, from instrument to instrument. Not quite. And to this day, like I've never ever, I play several instruments, but I can't, I've never perfected any of them, you know, but I know I could tell you each and everything about it and where it sits in the band. And I learned in the long run that my mm -hmm. instrument looking back has been not one instrument, but the band being a band leader so i've learned how to play that instrument as a band and then later the crowd as an instrument and it just gets all these little deep thoughts that you look back and you you're thankful for the things that you've gone through and the struggles and the frustrations because ultimately it sets you up for the mentality you, you have wow bro i like hearing you talk <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because these type of interviews are the kind that geek me out because I wish, honestly, that I wish when I was younger, I could have took the time because I had, I had them all. I had all the stuff here, mm -hmm. but my thing was like, I could play certain notes and then I would tell my musician, this is what I want played, bro. You know, I could hear it. I'm going to hum it to you. Mm -hmm. And the dope thing about him was that he used to write out the notes. Yeah. Oh, it's this, 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 this. It's important. You know, and then he was like, well, uh, I go, can you give me a nice pad as well? Okay, you want that? Okay, cool. All right, you know, what about some roads? And, and then I remember, uh, remember that song, um, Dancing in the, the Moonlight, Everybody. Yeah, yeah. It starts off with the Fender Roads, like, yep. mm -hmm. and I was like, bro, I want something like this. And he was like, that's not rap. And Are I was these like, eyes? Yes. Bum, 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 bum. Yes, yeah. yes. He goes, but that's not rap. And I'm like, then I don't know what I'm trying to do then, bro. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> I had some boom bat beats, but I had that kind of music over it. That must be frustrating trying to convince everybody that the sound, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So it, ahead it, of its time. Yeah. It, it, it was frustrating for me because I couldn't find rappers because they all wanted to do with what's popping. Yeah. Nobody radio. wanted to take the chance on let's be different, mm -hmm. you know? But okay. So. So the ska band, how long did that last for? How far did you go with that? That I mean, that first ska band didn't last very long, I think. But you know, the people and the because the thing that the thing that I look back on that that ska band was that like the guy that I've always considered my parallel as far as musically, you know, my my John Lennon to my Paul or whatever you want to look at it. You right. Know? He his dad was a was a professional singer and has been since the seventies. You know. And he, he was a lead singer. And, you know, when we would go to his, my, my friend's house, Tony, to practice and rehearse, you know, at the end of the night, his dad would be coming from gigs. and like, I want you guys to unload this trailer, this PA, or set, put these wires. And, you know, we were learning how to, like, appreciate equipment and kind of just, like, what it took. Oh, you guys are practicing? Well, this is what comes on with it, you know? So he kind of put in our head early on making a profession out of it, which was probably the worst idea you could do to a 12 year old, you know? Right. So, um, you know, at that point we just became just tunnel vision to that and just wanting to do all the work that came along with it. But, you know, he kind of showed us how to respect it in a sense, you know, and that's not just about, you know, you play a song, you one song, boom, you're rich, but about you put in the work, you go to these gigs, like, you know, see what time I'm coming home tonight. That's the time you're going to come home. You know, and, and like now I, I look back at that now because I come home late, early in the morning, you know, 
if not the next day, if, you know, something in the flight misses or anything like that. So I, I get the, you know, the, the patience you got to have with a lot of that stuff. But it was it was definitely just a learning process that we got exposed to yeah. really early on. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, what did Joey ended up doing? Did you end up joining another band? Did you end up going solo or what took place after that? I think, you know, like from that, you know, like there was a local band kind of coming up because, you know, East L.A. was kind of like a very... I want to say like a little small, not a small circle, but it was kind of like an elite little, you know, East L.A. was so prideful of East L.A. And, yes. you know, to represent it meant you had to be all in, you know. So, you know, when 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 that band kind of failed out, you know, I was I was one of the few only trombone players. And I remember we had an audition. You know, there was this like a local band kind of coming up because it was a punk band called Union 13. And they had just got signed to Epitaph Records, which was kind of a bigger label, you know, owned by... Uh, Owned by the some of the guys from Bad Religion. Okay. And um, so you know that was kind of like, like again, punk rock was it was a big thing. So everybody was like, "There's a way out, and there's get this deal, and this you know do these shows, and you know make it a profession." But ska music was right behind that, so all of us were working towards that. And um, an, the next band behind that was kind of like was was a band called Upground from East LA, and they kind of like the early two thousands, late late nineties. And they had kind of seen, and they needed a trombone player, and they were like, "This, like, he'll do it, you know." So, we'll try him out. So I remember going to an audition with like two of the guys that went to my high school had played trombone in the marching band that I had seen like the night before at a game, you know. And we we're all there auditioning, and like, you know, everybody's going through the parts. One guy wasn't a good player, but he had a van, so there that was like, <laughs> so that was that. And then the one of the other guys was a really good player, but his mom was really really strict, you know, didn't want him. You know, and, and at the time, that band had a reputation of being like, you know, because they were still in high school. They were still in Garfield, but they were playing these big shows all around L.A. and getting some attention. So, you know, they had like a, a reputation of being a little bit wild and, you know, like or being stoners and this and that. So, so then I was the third guy with this kid who was just hungry, who just wanted to do it, who was who showed up first and left last and was just, you know, he learned all the parts, but was just way too young you know so they ended up deciding we're gonna take the, the guy with the van and the young kid you know so, so we was in a band we were in a band at the same time for a minute and then he kind of fizzled out and they kept me and that band grew traction and we, we did like a bunch of tours and we did the south by southwest and we had like a reality show based on us and all this stuff and it was just like they're gonna be the next thing you know and yeah. there was a lot of anticipation and a lot of hype for it and then like our manager passed away and she was like the driving force promoting wise and who really you know kept us in line because we're at the time we're eight eight you know 19 to 24 year olds you know wild kids just trying to play shows do this and that you know but when she passed away it kind of like put a break on everything and it kind of halted everything all the momentum and that kind of fizzled out so it was kind of like this frustration of being in these things that kept getting momentum and then dying out <clears throat> so wow okay yeah. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the channel a little bit because i got a couple of questions I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. Interesting questions. Okay. <sighs> Say somebody one day on a late night, you're out drinking whiskey. Mm -hmm. You walk out of the bar, somebody walks up to you and says, I can make this happen for you. And you're like, what you talking about? You have an opportunity to meet Prince, Michael Jackson, Marvin Gaye, Bob Marley, Freddie Mercury. You can sit down with them for one hour and talk to them. Who would it be? I'll repeat it again. Prince, Michael Jackson, Marvin Gaye, Bob Marley, Freddie Mercury. All right. I'm going to spin this back around and say I'd smoke with Bob Marley, get him high <laughs> enough to be there for another 30 minutes, and then go out to, uh, you know, probably probably walk, walk right up to Prince and be like, can, can you hang out with me and my friend Bob Marley over here? <laughs> and then just try to win that situation ultimately. It should be a fight between them too because, you know, there's so many, so many questions and so much mystery and mystic around Prince. You know, I, I think I've, I feel like I know everything about Bob Marley as far as like, you know, the story and stuff like that. And, you know, because, you know, the, the, the grateful thing that I'm able to say is that, like, a lot of the people that he, a lot of his peers I've been able to work with, you know, a lot of wow. the singers coming through, like I said, back in the day when they were coming through L.A. on their way to Northern Cali, they'd come out and use us as a band, as their L.A. band, cheap band, you know. 
So we'd be the cheapest option for them a backing band, and we'd learn all these stories, and we'd hear, we'd hear the stories you don't really hear on the documentaries about how Bob would bully, bully them when they were on the soccer field or stuff like that. So, wow. so I feel like you know I'd, I'd probably spend a little more time leaning towards Prince, maybe just because there's so many questions and just intriguing things that I'd like to know. Everybody knows here at Rodeo and Radio that Prince is my dude. <laughs> When he dropped the Purple Rain album, me and my boy Angel, we went. He actually bought me a ticket. We went right here to Long Beach Convention Center, and we saw him live. You know, we saw him wearing the boots, the G-string, and the trench coat. You know, so we saw him. It, it was amazing, bro. How did you, was it like like seeing like like a monk or something? Was it like this energy? Or anything yeah, yeah no, it, it truly, truly yeah, was. I believe it. I it, believe it. it truly, truly was. And then when I, I remember I landed in Colorado, and uh, somebody texted me and told me, Prince just died. What the fuck? Like, I tripped. And I told, my, I told my friend, hey, you know what? Turn on the radio really quick. So he turned it on, and they just went. Uh, uh, the artist formerly known as Prince, blah, 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 has passed away, and they played a uh, little record Yeah. You know, I collected all his promos with the extra long versions at mm -hmm. the end of Little Record Red. Uh, Let's work uh, 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 promos with the extra long version. Everything, that, every vinyl that Prince ever released, I owned. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, he's right here, bro. So maybe you can talk there to him after. Go. There we go. <laughs> so... But yeah, Prince was, uh, um, you know, was, was my dude. Yeah. So and you, you know, I don't know if you've seen those, um, the tales from the tour bus, the the what is it, the the guy who does the King of the Hill stuff. I can't remember. Yeah, the, the, the the cartoon stuff. The cartoon stuff yeah. and this, the stories that you hear, like you know George Clinton talk about him, or or um, you know um, what's his name, with Morris Day. You know, and like that way they talk to him, it's just so like he's like a he's like a comic book character, you yeah. know, and he's like a superhero, you know, not yeah. not a comic because that's you know he's a superhero because he throws his guitar up and it doesn't come back, or because he you know <laughs> he just sits in the corner doesn't talk and writes his epic like so it's yeah okay I'm gonna tell you something I don't know if, uh, David remembers this, but I told him this about you, that's Latin Prince right there. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. Now, somebody may say, Tony, you're jockeying, you're trying too hard. Nah, bro. I, when you walk through that gate, you know what I told you. Okay? So I, I talk too much to be Latin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now here's a couple more. Okay, so you win with Prince on that round. Here you have Selena, Richie Valens, Vicente Fernandez, Juan Graviel. Richie Valens all day. That, that, that would be my pick, too. Yeah. I'm like weirdly going back to what I said earlier. I'm like obsessed with Richie. His his birthday is a day after mine, so like you know I've always kind of like every time I have my birthday, I always kind of have another birthday for Richie. You know, because I just like there's so many things that you could think about of had he continued his career at the age he was in the era he was that that Latin crossover would have happened years before. You know, there there would have been. Latinos in major motion films years before that, or music composers, everything. Lose anchors, I feel like, because that would have happened. He would have done that, I feel like. Yeah. But yeah. you know, and, and there's just so many, so many things that you hear about, you know, that whole day the music died and you know how important Buddy Holly was and you know, the big bobber, but like the biggest blow to me has always been Richie because that would have changed the world in my perspective. Wow. Wow, that's awesome, man. Um, I know it might be kind of hard to ask, but just give it a shot. Prince walks in and sits down next to you. What's one of the first things you, you say? Favorite guitar. I just ask him what his favorite guitar. Mm, I, first guitar, not favorite, first. Okay, wow. Because that's important. I feel like your first guitar is, is kind of like who you're going to be. You know, if, if, if you started on a humble pawn shop guitar, you know, you, it, it didn't sound right the first time. You had to keep tuning it, you had to keep playing it, and you had to keep working on it, which ultimately made you better. But if you had that that brand new guitar out of the shop and it worked and you got bored of it and there was no challenges in it, you would have put it aside, you know. Oh. That's what I feel. Yeah. Okay. Richard Valens walks in and sits down. What do you ask him? What do you say? Oof. That That's... that's Oh man, that's 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 a tough one. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I went to uh, it was a San Fernando Valley car show, and it was a, I, I believe they were saying it was hosted by Danny Trejo, mm -hmm. and so I went there it was a couple of years ago, and I realized I looked at San Fernando Valley High School. It didn't dawn on me where I was at. 
And it's it's weird because every I started asking, hey, uh, I don't want to sound goofy, but is that the school that Richie Valens went to? And they were like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it was so weird because it was an emotional moment for me too, to, to know that this guy who's no longer here with us was here. Mm -hmm. And now I'm here. started, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a deep one, man. So, wow. It's funny we picked the same ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a favorite Prince album? Uh, you know what? I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Yeah, it's it's tough. I I, I kind of like like. There, it, it's tough. I'll just I'll leave it at that. It's it's like picking your best, your favorite Beatles album. I'm a big Beatles fan, yes. and you know like the changes. It changes with the seasons. You know, you could like one album, and then next week you're liking another one. So it's just it changes with with the time of day, season. I'll say with Prince because it's very very hard. But I would probably have to say no, Fox. See, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. See, you can't. It's, it's, <laughs> Because oh. then you start like finding, you start thinking of everything, and you, yeah, it's a never ending. Situation. Like for an example, the 1999 album, I could listen to it all the way through. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw the video of the 1999 song, they're playing the Oberheim on there, and I'm like, that's my fucking keyboard. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. So I will say that one. I remember, uh, I'm trying to remember the 12 inch, but it was a song that I believe was no, it probably was on the album. Uh, Let's pretend we're married. Doom. You know which one was big in my house was the Batman soundtrack. Oh, which, yeah. You yeah. know, so it was like, I, I like weird ones, you know. No, Vicky Vale. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's a badass song, yeah, bro. They're, they're great. That was a great one. No, but remember uh, when it when it drops and it goes, uh, uh, um, uh, stop to press, stop. Dun, 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 dun. That's where uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot sampled beepers. Yeah, but, yeah. So yeah. that one was dope, but and then you go over to uh, the Purple Rain album, mm -hmm. and then I like the shit like Darling Nikki. Yeah, see, going back to that thing about albums, like you can have a favorite song, but the albums is if you can listen to the whole album way through. And I think Purple Rain is probably one of the ones that I don't have to bounce around a lot. You could just mm -hmm. listen to it in sequence. Now, now let me ask you this, and I'm asking this about yourself. Do you have an album yet that you can't skip a song? Do it like that I've made mm -hmm. of my music. Yes. I don't think I don't think so. <laughs> my stuff's all over the place. I don't even think I have a full length album yet. So okay, it's still, still working. But I mean, they're, they're, oh, you know what? Yeah, because I do actually. I technically do, but yeah, but yeah, it's it's another one of those never ending questions. Okay, okay, that's cool. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and take a ten minute break. We're gonna come right back, and I got a couple of more questions, and we're gonna promote the uh, to live and die in LA. Uh, event that's going to take place March 26th this Saturday. Once again, Rodian and Rado's going to be there live. We're going to be podcasting. We're going to be podcasting, interviewing all the bands. Maybe some bands you heard, somebody didn't, but support everybody that is coming up. Once again, get your tickets uh, to Live and Die in LA. And uh, God, man, I always forget what the hell I'm going to announce. But anyways, we'll be back 10 minutes. Once again, commercial break. We'll be back with Joey Quinones.
Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio, episode 238, and I must throw a bottle at one of my guys over here. Anyways, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right back into it with Joey Quinones. What's that, man? Dude, I'm a, like, I'm a perfectionist, so I'm like, I like to run my stuff smooth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I so, think I see we made it to the drinking round. Yes, we did. We did. <laughs> yes. And as uh, a matter of fact, we'll crack open this bottle that my boy bought me for my birthday, even though my birthday is March 28th. I'll be 54 years young. Does so that mean you're a Pisces? Yeah, no, oh, Aries. Uh, Aries, you just made it. Yes, yes, I just made it. As a matter of fact, Tony A stands for Aries, stands for uh, uh, Anaconda, Alpha, Aristocrat, whatever. Aries, yeah, yeah. Aristocrat, <laughs> total. So, okay. so I'm going to serve Joey here a shot. We're going to take a shot live on Rodian Radio. I sip mine, so if you want to sip on yours, cool. We got more if you need it, because we usually kill a whole motherfucking bottle. What do you think, Prince? I don't know. What do you think, Prince? I think he would sip it, too, I feel like, yeah. Okay, salud, Joey. Salud. To you, bro. Cheers. Thank you, man. Cheers for having me. So. Mm. I wait. Oh, shit. Okay. Anyways. Um, damn, I forgot what I was going to ask. That's what happens. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, Prince? <laughs> uh, um. It, this might be an odd question, but I, I I like to ask odd questions. Bohemian Rhapsody, the movie, did you like it? You know, I couldn't sit through all of it. I Re- couldn't. Really? There was a lot of it that I didn't, you know, given I'm not too knowledgeable of the history and all the, you know, because uh-huh. I, I read a lot of Beatles books. So I when I see anything Beatles, I'm like, that's not happen. That didn't happen. That didn't happen, you know. But th- I wasn't able to watch that one all the way through. I, I mean, I enjoyed the same reason why I'm sure you watch a lot of movies, just to see a lot of the gear and the stuff. Yeah. And, Musical continuity, if you say, but I, I wasn't too attached to the story or the, or really the production of it. Really, I think okay. I think the Ray Charles movie is like the best, you know, like because it did so oh. well. And there's a scene where he's like in the club and they're like jamming and he's like singing, but like the mic's away, like a little bit further away, and then he starts the song, but he's like singing away from the mic because he's blind. You know, it would right. happen. It's Ray Charles, but then he grabs it and he pulls it closer to him, and then the, the volume of his voice gets louder. And just for that happen to into a movie like that, it just seems so real, and it puts you in that place of things that of being in that moment. Because when you listen to live records, they're not perfect, but right, and that's why you love them, you know. Yeah. What about uh, the way Val Kilmer played Jim Morrison in The Doors? Did you see that? I loved, I loved The Doors movie. I did. Me too. I like whether you know, and again, I'm not too knowledgeable of the history of that, because, um, but I love the way that it was, it was, it was played, and and I, it was entertaining to watch. It was good. Okay. I had a conversation through a friend of mine that, that introduced me to Ray Manzarek, the keyboardist for The Doors. Mm-hmm. So I asked him in Miami, Jim Morrison got arrested because supposedly <coughs> he whipped out his tallywhacker up on stage. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I asked him if that was true. And he said, to be honest with you, he was in front of us. We do- yeah, he could have yeah. done it. He goes, I, I know the movie showed the, he, that he put his finger out. Some people said it was finger. Some people said it wasn't. He goes... We didn't see it. Yeah. You know, so. That's a story. They're sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But you know what, Sean? I, I, I did like. I'll be honest. I liked the James Brown movie. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, I liked okay. it. Yeah. I, I'll tell you what part, believe it or not, it meant a lot to me. And I think this is the way I saw music. Um, there's a part where he's a little kid. And if you remember, he's boxing. And he, they, tied, uh, uh, they tied his arm. Yeah. He fights yeah. another black little kid. Well, he gets knocked out. And he's laying there. And it's a it's a it's a part where it's a a bunch of men playing. Burr, burr, burr. They're just playing just some, like some weak ass song. And he turns it into like a yes, but yeah. mm-hmm. but and then there's times like when I listen to the classical music, I'm like, bro, I could take that fucking sound. Yeah, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, damn. So that meant a lot to me when I said, man, mm-hmm. there's other people that think like me. Have you seen the uh, the Wu Tang, uh, the American is it American Saga? I think yes on Hulu. That same thing. There was a scene where I think Riz is like sitting down at the desk and he's like, because he's sampling and he's like he, he pulls up in his mind the band from you know the what was it the Gap band maybe you uh-huh. know? and he's like listening to this band and he's like kicking members out like going through the mixes and I'm just like that's exactly how I feel like when I'm at the board because it did a, a good such a good job you know, portraying like the act of producing and mixing and kind of like going in and out with things and trying ideas out right. when you're in that moment of that, you know, cause it was like, you know, there's two drummers playing. He's like, no, nah, I don't want that one. And he fades it out and it gets softer and to the point where he's disappeared and he just starts, it just felt so I connected to that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, okay. 
I don't want to say his name, but I'll tell you afterwards. I believe that uh, this guy's a legend when it comes to engineering, okay? I sat in the studio with them for over 10 years. And uh, I, get, I like to get my own levels, mm -hmm. and then I'll let him tweak the sounds, EQ the sounds, add effects to whatever. Yeah. Then I'll come back, listen to it on a little small speaker, see if I can hear every hat, snare, crash, you know, uh, uh, kabasa or whatever mm -hmm. you have on there. If I can hear it, cool. Play it on playback, the big ones. Okay, now that shit's bumping. He, his sound is just so beautiful, man. Like, I, I don't like to work with any other engineer. So I asked him one day, man, what do you think that makes you different? Like, why do you think everybody hires you to, to engineer their shit? And he said, my ears, same thing you said, mm -hmm. my ears. And I was like, bro, like you seriously got those ears. Yeah. And, and for those of you that, uh, I'll give you guys a hint who it is. He uh, engineered uh, Tupac's All Eyes On Me album. So uh, Dr. Dre told him, go ahead. Yeah. You know, but now, my question to you is this. I believe, and I told him this, he spent so much time tweaking sounds, engineering, getting the new you know, technology to make every sound sound better, mm -hmm. that I think it took away from his actual production. Do you ever fear that sometimes spending so much time possibly engineering that it could take away from your creativity of production? Absolutely, yeah. You know, I had a session recently where I was working with, uh, you know, there's this, there's this uh, local record shop in East L.A. called Sonido de Bahia. Mm. And uh, um, owned by two two guys, you know, same age as mine, same background, you know, kind of thing. And they opened up a record store. And, you know, it's a thriving business right now in the right. neighborhood. And, you know, they decided to put out a re record and they did some Ralphie Pagan covers. Yes. And they invited me to do, you know, to say I love you, <clears throat> which is a great tune, a great strong tune. And, you know, I always get the comparison to Ralphie as a vocalist. Mm -hmm. And given I have never, I was never really in, like, in, in, like, I am Richie or anything else, like, the way I was, you know, with Ralphie. So, you know, I had to learn this tune, and I had to kind of become obsessed with it and learn it and learn it. And I showed up to the studio, and we were there for maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, boom, left. And the, the producer on that record, Skip Keller, great, great great musician, local musician, rock and roll, Chicano rock historian in my eyes. Um, you know, he produced the record and he kind of made it, you know, I went, I was in and out and I was like, oh, man, you know, this doesn't feel right. Usually I'm in the studio all day, you right. know, like usually I'm doing things, you know. And then like, you know, I flash forward to a year later when I'm, I met one of the bands that were on, one of the members that were on that record. I wasn't for, there for the musician take, but I was there for the later take. So I met one of the musicians like, hey, I'm on that record with you. And it's like, like, oh, man, like, let me tell you about that, man. I was like, and I heard it back and I'm like, that's the best like I've ever recorded and best, you know, I've ever sounded in my voice, you know, like, I don't know what he did, but he's like, oh, yeah, cool. I'll let him know. So flash forward another couple weeks later and then I run into Skip again, the producer, and he's like, well, yeah, because you didn't spend all day setting up mics for other people and engineering the whole damn thing. You just went in there and sang You're like you should, you know, and I was like, man, this guy's, this guy's he's right because you know, when I make records, it's always, I'm always worried about everybody else. And then, okay, and then I'll do my part later, if later ever comes, or right. I'm doing mine last. So it's always kind of like, you know, not as much time as I would on the drums or the other vocalists. So, you know, like, I think that I always kind of get fear of, of putting too much work in to kind of blow my fire out to, like, get in there and do my, my part of the job. But more and more, I've been trying to balance in that more and getting a little bit more people into the roles of engineering or arranging you know not just relying on everything on me because before i do everything I'd, I'd write i'd arrange i'd produce i'd mix record mix master and then shop you know <laughs> so it, it was you know now i'm able to give other people jobs so it kind of lets me focus more on that which which i with the same exactly to your questions like i always kind of fear of that taking away from the performance because i spent so much time on the production you know? yeah because uh okay i'm going to get i went from djing to producing, then I started engineering, okay, all throughout the 90s. So I started spending so much time tweaking a fucking tambourine, Yeah, you know? And then by the time I got it all crisp and clean, I was like, hell yeah, this shit's dope. I had to go do a show. I hadn't been practicing on the turntables. I used like, like I'm crisp and clean on my scratching. This shit was like, what the fuck? Like I noticed that I wasn't 
practicing, I wasn't into it, and I just sounded terrible. Mm. My boy's like, no, nah, you sound pretty good. Now, nah, bro, the way I am, that shit was terrible. You need to get yourself another DJ. Perfectionist, yeah. Yes. All the greats are. Yeah. And, and, and I was like, you know what, bro? I can't do this anymore. So I had to quit one because I didn't want to be, uh, um, what do you call it? The, the jack of all trades, the master of none. Exactly. Yeah. And that's definitely a fear. Yeah. Because you know, I don't get to spend, because, you know, like, I could play a horn, but you put me in a situation with horn players, I'd probably be the weakest link. You know what I mean? Because they have the miles and the endurance of playing some hundred gigs. And mm -hmm. I was in the studio 20 minutes last night, you know? Right. So, but it's, it's like, that's always a fear, but it's always kind of, every time I walk in the studio, I try to play everything that I touch, everything that I have there, whether it's the keyboard, the trumpet, the sax, whatever. I like to keep everything set up so that way I could walk up to it, play, and just keep yeah. putting energy yeah. through it. Yeah. I want to say it was 2018, I believe when somebody told me there's a guy named Joey Quinones that you need to hear. I, I'm being real with you when, when I say this. And I was like, okay, who is he? You got to check him out. Okay, cool. And then I think about a year later, somebody sent me a YouTube. One thing, I, first of all, I was just impressed with everything. Okay. But one thing that stood out because I kept saying, is this guy still alive? <laughs> okay. Let me, let me tell you why I say that. And he goes like, yeah, he's still alive. And I was like, no, he can't be. Like, he can't be alive. And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, bro, the song was done like in the 50s or 60s. Look how old this sounds. Yeah. You see where I'm going? Yeah, totally. you know. So I was, he was like, no, this is a new guy. No, bro, this song's old. You know, not saying that you remade it, but the sound that I was hearing. It was just like if you just drop a fucking, if you would have just added the crackle at the beginning of your song, uh, you know, I, I would have said for sure the guy's dead. <laughs> but nah, bro, but it, that's when I was introduced to your sound. So I'm not going to ask you how you do it because you'll be giving away secrets. But as far as what made you move into that direction, man, of making it sound like if it came out then? I, I know your love for vintage stuff. Mm -hmm. Was that part of it? I think, yeah, a lot of it. I think just, you know, Every band I've ever been in, especially when we were playing reggae and ska, uh -huh. it was like, you know, this is the music we like. Like, you listen to the records. We want to sound like that. How do we sound like that? And there was a lot of bands that were doing it. Uh -huh. And it was like, so it's it's possible, but can we take it to the next level? Uh -huh. You know, but, you know, even going through that whole kind of trial and error phase, like, you learn that even if you had the same drum kit, drum heads, drumstick, room, microphones, as you know as al jackson you're not going to sound like al jackson on al green's record you know you, you you're going to sound like al jackson when you're al jackson and you play like him right. you know so it became like this whole trial and error thing of getting the technology getting the equipment right into a dead end and then relearning how to play you know i think that was the biggest thing is like a lot of people you know when when they when they listen back to that vintage sound it's not because they're using an ampex eight track machines because they're playing like that and then this is the happens to be a machine that they're using at that time and you know and I'm, I'm there's a lot of equipment that i'm still kind of fishing for and i feel like i need to have mm -hmm. but deep down i know that it, it it starts with the player you know and that's that's always kind of the biggest thing so i think just kind of getting to that mentality of getting everybody on the same page to the song committing to the song and learning how to serve the song correctly facilitates the the sound and the vibe that you would have gotten in the 60s because that's what they did you know they had the musicians come in learn the charts do it do it do it do it do it had the singer come in do it do it do it print it you know and there wasn't a lot of after editing and a lot of mixing so i try to kind of get everybody to make their the way that they want to sound ultimately at the end in the beginning just to capture it off the bat mm. and, and I'm, it, go ahead, i'm sorry, sorry and it just it just creates for easier mixing and quicker you know because you, you're there you already mix you're ready to print okay um shit, i wish i, I would have brought it out man Okay, I have a, on my other room right here, I have several two-inch... Uh, reels. Yes, yeah. reels, okay. One of them I wanted to open up, and I wanted you to look at the paperwork, because it's got track one, track two, a 24-track. We recorded on an old Tax Scorpion, but I have a Tina Marie track that I never released. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sitting in the next room, and I wanted to show it to you. But I forgot during break to go get it. So uh, I'll but, remind you after. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, we actually redid a song, the song called "Loving You" by Minnie Rippleton. Mm -hmm. So I, I had the bass played uh, by with the Moog, and I had, uh, of course, the Fender Rhodes on there. So and I had some boom bap shit on it, and I she sang. It sounded like my real fucking dope. Nice, nice. So, but um, 
my thing is this. Um, is it safe to say, you can say, next question, do you still record on tape? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's dope. I yeah. like that, man. I spend way too much money on buying tape. <laughs> <laughs> cheers to that. Cheers, cheers. <laughs> hmm. Okay, now, what a lot of people may not know today, you know, you invest a lot of time in getting your sound. What a lot of people don't know is that back then, like, let's just say like the group, like the Doors, a lot of groups recorded their albums on four tracks, mm -hmm. you know. Now, on four tracks, four, four channels, mm -hmm. okay. Four chances to make it right. <laughs> yes. And timeless classics. Yeah. Timeless. Bretton Wood. Yeah. Yes. Now, here's where people think I'm picking on this generation. I'm not. I'm just trying to make a point. Today we have unlimited sampling time, unlimited technology, you know, at your fingertips. And I just don't see music getting better. Yeah, because there's no urgency. There's no, we need to get this all in sync and get it right on the same page now because we're not going to come back. We can't. It's physically, technically, in the, for the era, we cannot go back and do it. So please get it right. And people freak out. It's like, we got to get it right, you know. And, like, you know, people like Phil Spector did a great job of getting... 20 people to get on the right page, you know, on, on one take, you know. And I think that's what's, what's missing in music is just like that mentality and that kind of ADD-ness of, oh, I'll do it later, I'll fix it later, or later, next, next. I mean, you know, it's just more volume than, than you know, I guess more, what's the saying, more uh, quantity than quality. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there was an article, uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but... It was an interview that they did with Quincy Jones, okay? By the way, I loved Quincy Jones' documentary on Netflix, okay? He was talking shit about the Beatles, mm. okay? I don't know if you ever ran across it. He, he, I think, the, what was the drummer's name? Ringo. Ringo, okay. He said that he had Ringo in a session one time, and <laughs> he goes, this guy couldn't play with a shit. That's what he said. He goes, so when he left for a break, I had my boy go in there and fuck it up. Mm -hmm. He goes, and then when Rico came back, he goes, yeah, it doesn't sound too bad. It sounds nice. He goes, yeah, motherfucker, you didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, fuck. Like, he must have been on a good one because he actually threw Michael Jackson under the bus. Yeah. You know, he was saying, oh, Michael Jackson stole that bass line from uh, uh, Donna Summer, I believe. He goes, all he did was slow it down. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, you got to have balls to, like, tell rock stars they ain't got nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's exactly what a producer is. Like, you know. Yes. So, he, so later on, he came back and made a statement that he was a little bit under the influence. He said, he said a little bit too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just thought that was fucking hilarious. 80s Ringo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said that was, he, I thought that was fucking hilarious. Now, um. Have you ever met, interesting question, you, you ever met an artist like, man, I got to meet that dude. I got him. And then you meet him and he's a totally fucking asshole. Mm. Have you met anybody like that? Musician, no. I don't think. Well, maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to. No, don't throw him on it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to throw him under. But, you know, there's been those times where, yeah, I wish, I wish I wouldn't have met you in the situation, yeah. Yeah, I remember there was this one guy, I, was, I won't say who it was. But I was just like, oh, my God, that's him. And I'm like, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. I was a teenager. Excuse me, sir. And I just wanted to shake his fucking hand. That's it. And he turned around, what the fuck do you want? From that point on, never listened to him again. <laughs> and I remember I asked my older brother, man, did I say too much? He goes, no, no. You're just a fan. That's it. Yeah, yeah. These guys have to understand. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Anyways. Um, I'm sorry, mate. Can I make like a two? I'll keep getting this phone call from my edge. I just want to make sure I'm... All good. Is, there, is that possible? Yeah, go for it. Go for it, man. Whatever you do, don't put it on the speaker, on the loudspeaker. Sorry. We just, go I, for you it. Know what, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't want to kill the momentum of it. Real quick, I'm so sorry. All good. Um, you know, Put the camera over here, Alex. He's got to take this quick phone call, so I got to respect that, especially if it's from family. So once again, uh, March 26th, uh, uh, to live and die in LA starts at 12 o'clock. It ends at 10. The flyers on the screen. Uh, once again, get your tickets. You're going to see Joey Quinones headlining the show. You're going to see uh, Fabian Alomar. When you see him on the flyer, he himself will be there. Uh, and a lot more artists. Let me give a shout out to once again Migs Whiskey. He'll be there. And I also want to give a big shout out to once again 310 Micheladas. He always brings the bomb pineapples, the bomb drinks, everything. So get at him on Instagram. 
310 Micheladas, and he will bless you, of course, for, for money. So um, uh, hit him up, and he will definitely, he, uh, I think he does deliveries, right? Okay. Yeah, he does deliveries. And also, I want to give a shout out once again to David Vegas. We all know him as, when you see him, Mr. Vegas, okay? Uh, Mr., Mr., yes, Mr. Vegas. And uh, uh, like, this guy's the guy that's been hooking me up with a lot of dope interviews. So much love, much respect to him. And I'll give Norbert a shout out after. But, uh, but he's back. <laughs> Baby, he's back. My bad. All good, my bro. All my good. Bad, my, my bad members is uh, impatient. Sorry, he probably, he probably ripped the tape in and then he spliced. I know, right? Like, it's like, <laughs> the studio is on fire. You get that? No. <laughs> Sorry about that. All good, man. Okay, interesting question. If there's anybody living or deceased that, I want you to give me three, living or deceased that you would love to do a song with, who mm. would they be? Paul McCartney, Joe Strummer. Richie Valens, for sure. Hmm, okay. Definitely. That, that'll work. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I know not only are you a performer, you know, but um, some of the greatest performances that you have seen, uh, and, and who are they? Some of the greatest performers, and I've been blessed to become, like, you know, acquainted with over the years. I grew up, again, in kind of like in the kind of punk scene, so one of the bands that kind of stuck out to me was Agrolites because they were kind of reggae, but they always had that punk kind of mentality. Yeah, Agrolites from LA, shout out to them. Jesse Wagner was a great front man to kind of sip you, and they, they invited me on along with the tour to play bass. You know, okay. and I was kind of playing a lot of bass at the time. So they had me come along for this tour up to Canada, back down. And, you know, I remember it took away time from my band, and they were all mad about it, but I was just like, I'm going to learn from each and one of these. Because every time I go on, there's a year when I was, a couple years where I was going on with a lot of different bands as side members and kind of just getting the best seat in the house to see these great front men do their thing. And so I think Jesse Wagner from the Agri Lights has always been a kind of a big inspiration to kind of work the crowd and be a front man and, and kind of carry yourself and how to write songs even. And then um, Lech Wierzynski from the California Honey Drops up in the Bay Area, local band. I don't want to say they're local because they're constantly traveling and, and yeah. always on the road, but... You know, he did such, again, he did a such such a great job, you know, running a crowd and running a band, you know, that's which is really important, especially with keeping a big band with great players with, you know, who in their own right should be, you know, their own. Because the thing about the Sinceres is like every one of the members is is on their own right, like amazing, you know, and they all yeah. have their, a lot of time under their belt as musicians, recording artists and touring musicians and you know, like we share band members with the Altons. So like, you know, it's it's kind of easy to kind of like, you know, not really treat it as a band, but like more as like a collective. But we try our best to kind of balance everything to make it feel like one collective and not one greater than the other. So, you know, it's it's balancing that and, and kind of just getting all the recipes to work together well is, is, is the main thing to do that, I guess. I don't know. Okay, and, and like for people that may not know of uh, the Sinceres, how many members are in the group? Currently, there's eight of us, seven of us. Okay, yeah. and uh, can you... Uh, can I name them all? No, no. <laughs> <Just> no. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. <laughs> now, now uh, where can people, like say that somebody, I don't know, promoters watching in fucking Kansas City, and he goes, I'm going to book that guy. Do you have a manager? What, where can they contact you other than your Instagram? Or Lately, it? yeah, lately our bass player uh, has been taking kind of the helm with that. Uh, we don't have a uh, manager. Our, all of our booking and our, our pressing and everything else, with the help of, of, of course, uh, Coal Mine Records, is all in-house. So uh, we do our own booking. You contact us at thesinceresbooking at gmail.com. And you can always hit us up on, on Gmail. Uh, with that or, or Instagram and um, you know or at the shows I mean like the best shows we ever booked have been you know at bars after the gigs you know with people so you know we, we're, we're really we're really adamant about connecting with everybody after the shows before the shows because you know we, we're like I said we're 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 a bunch of punk rockers who always hang out in the parking lot regardless so you'll <laughs> run into us regardless in the way hell yeah Oh, yeah. I'm gonna give a shout out to my boy Cisco from Odessa, Texas. He hit me up before the interview and he goes, "Hey, bro, good luck with tonight's interview. Uh, let him know that there's a lot of fans that love Joey out here." Hell yeah! So I was like, "Hell yeah, I'll, I'll give you a shout out." So yeah, man. Other than that, okay. 
Okay, we, we, we uh, put up on the live chat. Uh, any questions for Joey? Well, the first question you, uh, you had asked already. Okay, which uh, was? Which was, uh, how do you get in touch uh, to book for the live okay. events? You said thesinceres at gmail.com? Yeah, as a full band. But always, you know, if you, I always do, um, you know, some, uh, sure. I always do some private events and kind of like, you know, like uh, anniversaries and, and greetings and gatherings and stuff like that privately as well. If people are in, 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 are interested in having eight foos at the house, you know, <laughs> using your bathroom, I'm always able to just hit me up on my page. Joey Keener is official for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> another question from uh, Sinaloa is Mio. Uh, she says, if you sing, if if you sing a Spanish cover, which song? Who inspired him to start singing? If I could sing a Spanish song, you know, one of my favorite Spanish songs of all time is Solamente, Solamente Una Vez, it was a, uh, Los Panchos. So yeah. I think that'd be the first one. I'd try to figure out a real sad way to sing that song. Yeah. A real sad way. A real sad way. Just, just drink whiskey. Uh, yeah, just more whiskey or tequila <laughs> mezcal, maybe. That might do the trick right there. Yeah, okay. And, and what was, there was a two-part question, right? No, that, that, oh, was, that was it. Okay. Yeah, or, or oh. he, he said, "Who would inspire him to start singing?" Because who, who did inspire? Who, him? Yeah, who did? Uh, Ray Charles and uh, Billy Joe Armstrong, Green Day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, um, my, my, if there's another question, let me ask him first. Okay. Do you ever uh, have you ever incorporated, or do you have a, on a mandolin? You, my guitar player loves playing mandolin. I love that, and song. I'm always encouraging him to try to put it on. Yeah, yeah. You know, we don't know we don't know anything about mandolin, but we know it needs to be in there. You know, if Phil Spector uses it, I'm going to use it. You know, it's funny. My, my dad used to always tell me, and I go, "What's that?" And he goes, "La guitarra que hace." <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that one. There you go. Yeah, and I was like, oh, oh, "Okay, okay, cool." Anything else? Else, we're good. Um, well, Spanish Fly is on the um, in the live chat. He says, "Do a song with Johnny D." Do a song with Johnny D. Yeah. Hey, fly. Hit, hit him on the DM. Yeah, Sorry. hit him on the DM. Okay. Other than that, brother, anything that I didn't ask you, anything you want to promote other than to live and die in LA, March 26th, we're going to see you there. Uh, well, you know, let me ask you, uh, how long is your set going to be? What can people expect from you, man? On You know what? Um, when we don't really bring the whole band, it's kind of, kind of special because we get to play a lot of the songs that, you know, we, we've either put on the LP that, we've been saving or stuff that I've been currently writing that I've tricked the guys into learning last minute. And it's, just, it's always kind of an exciting thing to add some spontaneity to it because, you know, like we have our set and it's, you know, we have our way of doing it. But for me as, as a performer, it's always exciting to get to, to kind of go out of outside of that a little bit. And I think that's kind of a special thing for fans to see sometimes because, yeah. you know, sometimes it's not perfect. Sometimes it's like, you know, they catch us like, ah, you messed up. And we let them know, like, hey, yeah, you know, and and it becomes we become human to them, and that's it, it. It creates kind of like a different vibe of, you know, I'm not just coming to see a band do their routine. I'm I'm here and seeing something that I'm involved in, you know. So so I think like when people come to see a Joey King on a set, it's kind of that feeling like I might play some reggae, I might play some something that I wrote wrote the other night, or you know whatever, or a cover that I've been listening to on the radio. It's it's always kind of fun for me that I hope kind of translates to the crowd. So, so, you said do some reggae? Oh, yeah. I love it. Uh, dub reggae. I mean, King Tubby and the scientists are like my, some of my engineer idols, you know, cause, just because of the, the, you know, the innovation that they did with, with the music, you know, even transitioning into hip hop and stuff like that. Like, dub reggae was huge in that, I feel like. That's dope, man. Yeah. That's fucking dope. I have so many more questions that I want to ask you, but I'll keep you here all night. We'll probably finish this bottle and then we'll probably hit a bar after it. But <laughs> <laughs> next time somebody says, hey, man, you missed up. I'm on whiskey, bro. What the fuck? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So other than that, bro, anything you want to promote? Anything I didn't ask you? Anything you want to bring up? Just thank you to all the fans and, and everybody who's been supporting it because, man, it's been unreal. It's, you know, like like I said, it, it's it's. I've said it in, in previous things. You know, this is kind of all kind of an accident, a happy accident that, wouldn't be possible without everybody supporting it and sharing it. And I love hearing the stories of people going through their struggles or going through their triumphs and, and, you know, the, the, just how you guys share it with the family from the kids to the grandparents. It's such a beautiful thing. Cause I've never been a part of something so special and that that spreads 
across so many spectrums and thank you guys for that so that's the only thing just shout out and shout out to the band of course my fantastic band shout out to the altons the illusions all the homies the escapers all the homies all good all good okay so we're, we're going to be there podcasting from five to ten okay uh Around what time are you going to take the stage for people can expect to see? I think it was like about 8, 8.30? Yes. About 8.35, I okay. think it was. Uh, if you can, because I know you're going to be busy I'll that be day. I'll be there. I'll be there. I want you to come through. I'll be there. Say hello to everybody live. Come through. So, absolutely, man. You know what? It's been a truly honor and a pleasure, bro. Uh, these are the ones that are like truly geek out to, bro. Yeah, Seriously, yeah. bro. Scared about so, I just want to tell you, thank you, bro. Yeah, thank you, Muchas Appreciate gracias, you. bro, for everything. Salud. Man. Salud. Hold on. I got a good week, bro, honey. This is my third one right here. So... Hey, we're like almost halfway this <laughs> motherfucker. Salud, Salud, bro. To a long and prosperous life. Thank you, man. Cheers. Once again, get your tickets. Uh, um, oh, where can they get the tickets right now if they wanted to online? They can go online or they can go on um, to Live and Die in LA Instagram and then there's a link to it right there. Okay, to Live and Die in LA Instagram mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there's a link to it right there. As a matter of fact, on Fabian's episode you can go on the description and the link is there shout out to fabian too man yes so once again uh let me give a shout out to uh once again uh frankie for putting this together let me give a shout out to mr vegas once again when you see him it's mr vegas <laughs> so he'll be there on saturday we'll all be there road and radio live my boy alex cervantes will be there norbert will be there anthony the hip-hop jedi will be there and uh, my son Viscanis will be there and i will be there so I hope to see you guys there. Get your damn tickets. Stop bullshitting. And uh, when you see me, I'll have some tequila and we'll take a shot. I promise you. So other than that, Joey, thank you. Much love. Much respect. Uh, we're going to take some pictures. And uh, remember, hey, uh, no show uh, Sunday. Saturday will be live for five hours. To live and die in L.A. Under the bridge. Under the bridge. Under the bridge walk. <laughs> <laughs> we out of here. Yo, call somebody, text somebody, slap the shit out of somebody. Let them know that Rodian Radio is live up in the CR.